Okay, so we are super privileged to hear from our speakers. Our first speaker today is Dave Feldman. He is a senior software engineer and entrepreneur. He began working with programming and system engineering at a very young age and has always enjoyed learning new mechanistic, mechanistic patterns and concepts. After starting a low-carb diet, Dave found his cholesterol numbers increased considerably. He then began reverse engineering the lipid system through self-experimentation self and testing, finding it was very dynamic and fluid. He has now demonstrated this multiple times by moving his cholesterol up and down substantially in a matter of days. So please welcome Dave Feldman. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for getting up so early for this. Okay, so of course my disclosures, and uh, I'm happy to share that if you don't get a good enough picture, uh, I will eventually have this up at cholesterolcode.com uh, slash SL18, probably in like the next day or two, and almost certainly with some errata, because you know there's always mistakes that we get, we get a chance to tweak. Now, I'm gonna open it with a true story. Uh, this actually happened last week. While I was in the middle of an experiment, I woke up to find that my LDL, according to my cardio check, was 205, and I was quite surprised by that. I therefore wanted to make a note, because I was about to do a retest, that sure enough, that lipid test seemed a little low. We'll now retest twice. And it did end up being what my calculations were, which would be closer to 240. So it was 237, 241. Whew. Only in this room would this make sense. <laughs> because yes, 240, a 240 LDL is at about the 99.7 percentile for the population of LDL. Most people who have an LDL at this level are people who have familial hypercholesterolemia, except for quite a lot of people who have gone into the low carb movement. And this, of course, begs some important questions that we're gonna to explore today. You guys pretty much know my bio by now, and if not, just <laughs> Google Dave Feldman. He looks more and more like a pincushion every day, and that's because, yes, the running tally right now is I've had 118 blood tests in the last 40 months. All those experiments you can see elsewhere. For right now, I'm going to be mainly focusing on risk. And I also kind of like this other description uh, that was told to me recently. In fact, I had a cartoon drawn up about it. It was by somebody who wasn't a huge fan of my work. They said, look, Dave, you're like a scientific bull in the lipidology china shop. A friendly, kind bull, sure, but even so. <laughs> but, but for what it's worth, his point is well taken. His translation is simply this. I'm afraid a lot of people see your research and they're taking your position as somewhat cavalier and that perhaps they could get hurt if in fact they are hanging out with a very high LDL cholesterol due to being on a ketogenic diet and they don't take that seriously. And that's why we need to talk about that today. And I'm telling you, every single day I'm regularly asked this. I'm asked, Dave, I've really enjoyed keto but my LDL cholesterol has gone up. Should I be worried? This is what I wish they would ask. I wish they would ask, Dave, I've really enjoyed keto where I've improved my cardiovascular risk markers like blood pressure, fasting insulin and glucose, waist to hip ratio, HDL cholesterol and triglycerides, but my LDL cholesterol has gone up. Should I be worried? To which I have a short answer. My short answer is genuinely, I don't know, but I'm cautiously optimistic. My slightly longer, more technical answer is I believe it's possible that LDL cholesterol is higher in a low-carb diet because it is part of fat-based energy trafficking. And my longest answer is this. <laughs> but we don't have a lot of time to go over that today, but no worries, soon to be covered in a paper with the help of Dr. Tommy Wood. Now, the question is really a pretty simple one. It's the central one, really. Are high levels of cholesterol in the blood Dangerous, full stop. Tweak that a little bit now, because in the last 50 years, it's more specifically our high levels of LDL cholesterol. Dangerous. Well, I can tell you right now what conventional medicine would say. In fact, this is right hot off the presses from the 2019 ACC AHA guidelines, where you can flip to section 4.3, and they state unequivocally, 
In patients 20 to 75, if you have an LDLC above 190, you should be on the maximally dosed statin. Out of curiosity, how many people in this room have an LDL of 190 or higher? <laughs> that's, a, that's quite a few. So something in the neighborhood, I want to say like around maybe a third of this room. Well, let's open our minds right now and truly take a look at the lipid hypothesis position. And I want to state plainly that I want to approach this in an intellectually honest way, and I want to represent their position as best as I can over the next section. Because I think it's important for us to understand them and make an informed decision by understanding where each person's coming from and what level of evidence they have. So this is kind of the lipid hypothesis in a nutshell, basically high, low-density lipoproteins ultimately cause vascular damage and dysfunction. And this eventually leads to atherosclerosis. Certainly this is a simplified version and there's many other elements involved, but this is basically the gist of it. And I will say this, I'm gonna go ahead and again, just to expand on the intellectual honesty, I wanna say that a lot would say that actually, while this is in the, the literature, I kind of put it this way, I call it the accelerant hypothesis. And there's many low carb doctors who likewise believe this, that basically, okay, there may be other things that cause vascular damage and dysfunction, but high LDL is kind of like an accelerant. The higher your LDL, the worse the resulting atherosclerosis. So it's, it's kind of like a multiplier. That's why I have like the X there, right? And so either way, either way, all else being equal, more LDL equals more atherosclerosis. Now this is the go-to study. If you want to know the study that's kind of now been positioned, the mother of all studies, the mother of all meta-analyses, that's got the strongest case that you have. In fact, it's right there in the title. Low-density lipoproteins cause atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And they have a central graphic here where they're basically saying across these three colored lines, these are the three different lines of evidence that show straight up the higher your, uh, the higher the magnitude of exposure to LDLC, the worse it gets. We have Mendelian randomization studies, which are genetic. We have prospective cohort studies, which are observational, and randomized control trials, mainly in the form of drugs, drug trials, right? And what they're using is what's commonly known as the Bradford Hill criteria, a slight modification of it, but fairly straightforward in that they have different assessments to make the claim of causality without actually observing causality because the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis has never actually been observed in vivo. So they're kind of using basically, Bradford Hill was uh, famous for doing this with smoking, for example. They're basically trying to do the same thing to establish the same level of evidence. Now, in another version of this talk, I could spend all day just on this and all of the different uh, pros and cons to each of the things they say. But I kind of want to focus in on what is probably one of the hardest parts of the assessments of Bradford Hill and its coherence, where they state monogenetic lipid disorders, prospective cohort studies, Mendelian randomization studies, and randomized intervention trials all show a dose-dependent log linear association between the absolute magnitude of exposure to LDL and risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. This is very strong to say all show. I think, to be fair to them, what they mean is all of the ones inside of the study show that. Because certainly outside the study, I'm gonna be able to show you things that show the otherwise. But let's just say that they're picking the biggest star power studies, that's what they're saying from within this. What, uh, and actually, this, they have another line here I kinda of wanted to draw out. Cumulative LDL arterial burden is a central determinant for the initiation and progression of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Cumulative LDL arterial burden. That's important. I also want to draw your attention to one other study, also worth reading in its entirety, because they basically make the same case, eradicating the burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease by lowering, and basically that mumbo jumbo is LDL, right? And they have this great graphic, it really illustrates it well, as to the way of the thinking for those people behind the modern version of the lipid hypothesis. You see that those people have, say, familiar hypercholesterolemia, which is a genetic disease that could result in higher LDL. If their LDL-C is, say, 390, from birth, they're going to hit having an atherosclerotic cardiovascular event or death really early, as, as early as, like, say, 20, right? 
If you have cardiovascular risk factors and LDLC of 130, you could be seeing it as early as, say, 45 or 50, right? And if you have, say, a PCSK9 loss of function mutation so that you're riding at around 100, you could make it up to 80. I want you to remember that age, 80. That'll come up a little bit later. But as far as what you can do about it, they have these dotted line arrows that show, hey, if you take some interventionary steps, such as, for example, if you have familiar hypercholesterolemia and you initiate a, a change to bring down the LDL, you may actually prolong the lifespan before one of these events take place, right? And that's kind of important because this becomes very relevant to how it is that we're going to assess how dangerous LDL is. Now, what the experts say, I'll bet all of you in this room already know, but just in case, just in case you needed some additional association with authority, the majority of lipidologists, these are the ones who spend their whole lives researching this, agree with the importance of lowering LDL. The majority of institutions like the American Heart Association, College of Cardiology, and European Atherosclerosis Society all advocate lowering LDL. And of course, the vast majority of doctors around the world agree with the lipid hypothesis and generally act to lower LDL. I wouldn't be offended if anybody right now said, that's enough for me, I'm going to go ahead and head out of the room and hit the bathroom, catch a movie. <laughs> All right. But is there an alternative hypothesis? Well, this being the lipid hypothesis, you may not have heard of this before. It's called the response to injury hypothesis. And what it posits is that actually vascular damage or dysfunction does indeed happen first, causes an inflammatory response, and this can actually recruit LDL. LDL actually may be part of the process of the response, and that this can ultimately lead to atherosclerosis. If you want to read more about it, you can look at their longer version of the name, which is chronic endothelial injury hypothesis. Doesn't that just roll off your tongue? In which they do make a point, and I want to kind of emphasize it as well, although an ongoing debate involving connection between dietary lipids and coronary heart disease sometimes portrays the two hypotheses as being opposed, they are in no way mutually exclusive, meaning it's possible that both of these hypotheses are, in fact, possible at the same time, right? Okay, but this is, this is the important question. Is this a containment strategy on behalf of the body that is still generally better than the alternative? It sounds like a crazy question, right? Like that we would actually, by design, have the body bring us atherosclerosis. But there is a big clue, and that clue is all-cause mortality. Have you guys ever heard me talk about all-cause mortality before? <laughs> well, you're about to really hear me talk about all-cause mortality. You must always keep in mind all-cause mortality, always. Now. I care so much about this subject, I'm actually going to really try to illustrate this through this grid. Pretend this grid is everything bad that can happen to you, everything, right? And obviously, if you're talking about cardiovascular disease in the white column to the left, one of the first things you think of is dying of a heart attack, fatal cardiovascular disease. But that's not the only bad cardiovascular disease outcome. Of course, you can also have non-fatal cardiovascular disease. You could have an event that's very debilitating. It could even leave you with, say, a stable angina. You could have a stable angina beforehand. There's all sorts of bad ways cardiovascular disease can work out. And it makes sense that if there's a study on cardiovascular disease, this is the column that they're looking at. They're looking at those things that can either kill you or not kill you and focus on events in particular. But that's not the only bad stuff that can happen to you, right? After all, there's also fatal non-cardiovascular disease. More specifically, everything that's fatal that isn't cardiovascular. So this could be cancer, this could be an injury, this could be diabetes, right? And the problem is you, ha you have to keep this in mind. You have to keep all-cause mortality. That's the combination of these two. That's everything. I, I once told my wife that um, the only three words I say more than all-cause mortality is I love you to you. She said, hmm, <laughs> it's clearly how much I say the words all cause mortality. So we still have this other fourth box. This fourth box gets no attention, really. And that's basically non-fatal, non-cardiovascular disease. Okay, you could get cancer 
and survive it. But is surviving cancer going to impact your quality of life? Talk to cancer survivors. It certainly can. You could get diabetes and get neuropathy. You could have limbs removed. Does that impact your quality of life? It definitely impacts your quality of life. Do these things get tracked by studies of cardiovascular disease? Do events that impact your quality of life that are not cardiovascular disease related get tracked? Well, the truth is, and it's, it's absolutely fair, there's really no study that can be powered to capture everything bad that happens to every participant. So that's why I'm gonna care a lot more about the bottom row over the top row. All-cause non-mortality is not something we're gonna see a lot of studies on. So, if LDL serves no benefit, it's fine. Lowering it can only be neutral or beneficial, right? So using the same grid, I can illustrate this easily. Cardiovascular disease risk improves, cool. And non-cardiovascular disease risk changes less relevant. And you know what? This is intuitive. This is what we think when we hear this. Okay, but what if lowering LDL has negative consequences for non-cardiovascular disease? In this case, what if non-cardiovascular disease risk worsens? And what if cardiovascular disease risk change is less relevant? Well, this is unintuitive. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say that I made a pill that could cure cancer. And I told you about this pill. I said, I got it. I cured cancer. I've got the pill. Your next thought isn't going to be, oh, OK, but what diseases will I get when I take this pill instead of cancer? You don't think that, right? And this is why, this is why all-cause mortality is absolutely critical to understand. It's the balance sheet. I want nobody leaving this room without recognizing how relevant this is to the larger topic. All right. Also, combining soft and endpoints is very problematic. And just real briefly, soft endpoints such as non-fatal myocardial infarction can have some degree of human opinion in the diagnosis. I think most of the time it's agreed on, but sometimes it's on the margins. And if it's sometimes on the margins, then things like even high LDL can influence the ultimate decision as to whether indeed it was a non-fatal myocardial infarction. That's unfortunate because it creates a self-reinforcing feedback loop. But conversely, hard endpoints such as mortality are much more objective and can be easily agreed among everybody. It's very easy to diagnose death. <laughs> So look, we need to consider if lowering LDL is a trade-off. Low-density lipoproteins are often referred to as a waste product. I've read it several times in the literature, suggesting no inherent benefit to the human body. Yet, LDL plays an important part in the immune system and host defense. There are many negative associations with low LDL, such as increased cancer, infection, and cognitive decline. This is important to bear in mind. So with this, what is the evidence against the lipid hypothesis? Well, I'm gonna go over those three different lines of evidence, and this is, this is the rebuttal coming from the other direction. But first, I just wanna say drug, drug trial evidence is just not that interesting to me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna kinda of pass the baton off. If you want, check out David Diamond's work, uh, Marianne DeMassey, they have excellent stuff, including excellent papers that go over, say, statin therapy and so forth. But I think a lot can be just summed into uh, this study, which was sort of brought out, it basically just covered all of the major cholesterol-lowering studies since the regulations hit in 2005. So it was a very good cross-section of lists, right? And basically outlined 29 of these different studies. And what did I look to? Did I look to heart disease and heart events? I didn't. I looked to all-cause mortality, which is why I love this list so much. And in this list, how many of these do you think, out of 29, showed a statistically significant difference in all-cause mortality? Anyone? Ah, ah, let's be intellectually honest here. Two, two out of 29. Judge for yourself. There's also a problem of natural selection. And I can illustrate this pretty easily. Basically, if a drug trial succeeds at lowering LDL, but it fails at increasing mortality, ah, it's a failed drug trial. You hear about them all the time in the waste bin. However, if a drug trial lowers LDL and lowers 
cardiovascular disease mortality, even if it doesn't lower all-cause mortality. Well, that's a successful drug trial. And it will likewise provide additional evidence of the importance for lowering LDL. Heads we win, tails you lose, right? Because guess what? This other one, it will be generally excluded from evidence regarding lower LDL in coming studies. I don't know if you guys have heard of, say, in recent years, there's CETP inhibitors, for example, cholesterol ester transfer protein inhibitors. Those resulted in a lot more all-cause mortality. Look right now into the meta-analyses of these other studies and see how many include CETP inhibitor trials, even though they've gone to market, right? They're considered a failed drug, and if it's a failed drug, then it doesn't count. This is, this is why, like drug trial study, or, I, I just don't find it as interesting. Now, prospective cohort studies, a little more interesting. There are actually many large-scale cohort studies that show an association of lower all-cause mortality with an increase in total and or LDL cholesterol. And I want to put in a critic's note, because it's fair to bring it up. Many critics of cohort studies where LDL improves outcome suggest it could be reverse causation. Very low LDL may be near, likely near the end stage, stages of disease. And that's possible, right? It's possible. It's something that we need to keep on the table to consider. But I'll have more to say on that later. Until then, check out this study. One of my favorite, this is out of Japan, is around, I want to say, 95,000 people. And this is showing serum LDL cholesterol with men on the left and serum LDL cholesterol with women on the right. And as you see, as their LDL cholesterol increases, their all-cause mortality also goes down. And why I like this study so much is if you look all the way to the right, the CHD deaths, right? That's the dark bars. You can see, especially with men, it is increasing. Coronary heart disease is increasing. That's that little part of the bar at the bottom, right? Their heart disease risk is going up. Their all-cause mortality risk is going down. You see why that's important? If, if you had only known about the coronary heart disease risk, you might assume as we all would, naturally, that all-cause mortality is also going up. You have to see it in that context. Now, this one I also love. This is the Norwegian Hunt study. And to be fair, this isn't specifically LDL. It's total cholesterol. But of course, uh, total cholesterol tracks with LDL cholesterol in general. But this shows as total cholesterol goes up, particularly for women, mortality goes down. And for men, while it goes up a little bit towards the end, it's still below the baseline that's all the way over to the left, right? This, but I particularly like this from their study. Uh, this, is, this is stratified in several different directions, both between uh, systolic blood pressure, non-smoking, and of course between both genders. But uh, what I enjoy is if you look up at the very top when you're age 60 to 74, really stands out. You really hope to have low blood pressure, not be a smoker, and have very high LDL. <laughs> or sorry, to have very high total cholesterol, right? All right. Gene studies, though, are one of my favorite topics of focus. It's because they actually sound pretty exciting. Basically, the assumption is that genetic variability resulting in higher and lower LDL could show an association with cardiovascular disease risk, right? It's, it's great, it's, it's, a randomization, it's a randomization trial that happens all on its own. And indeed, there are a number of SNPs that have both an association with higher LDL and higher cardiovascular disease risk. But there's a catch, there's a catch. The majority of SNPs used in these studies also include a third complication. They impact the lipid metabolism of the cell. You know how I just mentioned familiar hypercholesterolemia? That's often particularly the classic version of it. It's a mutation of the LDL receptor. That's the receptor in the cell. That's right over here. I have it over here. So it's having problems binding to it. And that's an issue because any disruption or dysfunction that prevents the normal uptake of lipids or lipoproteins by the cell should be excluded as it is a confounder regarding atherosclerosis, clearly. Which begs the question, Will we find increased cardiovascular disease associated with SNPs that impact LDL, but not lipid metabolism? But not lipid metabolism. So these cells are not being inhibited from getting what it is that they would want to get. Well, I reached out to Siobhan. Siobhan, by the way, joins us in the audience. It's going to have a speech later. You'll have to check. And to my delight, she accepted an assignment, which we hoped would be a few days. It turned out to be a few weeks. 
We were on the hunt for every SNP we could find that would show a change in LDL levels without affecting the lipid metabolism capability of the cell, right? And the slide I'm about to show you now, this, I'm gonna go through this, but what I'm about to go through is gonna take a few seconds. Truly, it was an enormous amount of work and I can't thank Siobhan enough for it. But this is what we did. What we did was we found a supplementary table that included a whole lot of non-lipid metabolism SNPs. And then we went through a whole qualifying phase. Gathering all the SNPs unrelated to lipid metabolism was the first step, excluding those that impact HDL and triglycerides. We were sure it was only LDL, right? Excluding those that had correlations already that were not investigated, which I'll get back to in a second. And then several other things to basically isolate it down one step at a time until we were quite certain that we had it down to one SNP where the criteria was met that correlated to increased risk. One SNP that we found out of all of these. But get this, one SNP that showed exactly the other was confirmed to not have an associated risk. The real tragedy of all of this work is that we found 26 SNPs that were non-lipid metabolism based that allowed for proper cell functioning, but were not investigated. And that's a bit curious. Naturally, I kind of wonder if they wouldn't have seen enough effect size in cardiovascular disease that they would then say, well, let's not bother pursuing this much further because there's more exciting SNPs that show a difference. But it also could simply be that they just didn't look. If, if there was somebody as part of our team who is just all about the genetics, that would be their full-time job, is to find all SNPs associated with LDLC changes, but that didn't impair the functionality of the cell. All right, gotta do a quick update on the low-carb cholesterol challenge. Who's heard of the low-carb cholesterol challenge? All right, well, it's still going. Uh, this is the graphic, if you haven't seen it, you should, because I first put this up, I wanna say February of last year, and basically I'm saying, look, hey, submit the best study you can find that shows normal, non-treated people who have high HDL, low triglycerides, and high LDL who have high rates of cardiovascular disease, full stop, right? And this basically leads to, in very simplistic terms, the lipid triad hypothesis, which relates back to the energy model. If you have high HDL, and if you have high LDL and you have low triglycerides, could you have low cardiovascular disease? If you do, that doesn't quite fit with the lipid hypothesis because the lipid hypothesis as it stands, you should have high cardiovascular disease risk in particular. Well, you may or may not have already seen this. Heck, I'm practically tired of showing these studies, but you've gotta see it because there are two studies that feature this triad, this specific triad. The first one is from Framingham Offspring, where sure enough, the odds ratio is surprisingly low for those people who had LDL above 100, and in the lower purple one, LDL above 130, but had an HDL of 50 or above and triglycerides of 100 or below. There also is this one from the Jeppesen study, where they stratified between low and high LDL, and then they substratified inside of those between HDL above 57 and triglycerides below 97 at the low, and then, of course, uh, HDL below 46 and triglycerides above 142 at the high. And you see that they're nearly identical whether you had high LDL or low LDL. This, I'm just going to squeeze in, but this is the geeky part. I hope you don't mind. I love this study. I love this study for multiple reasons. But in particular, they get into the apolipoproteins and breaking out the different apolipoproteins. What I, I love this uh, graphic in particular because it's a correlation chart, right? Uh, and sure enough, you see the best inverse correlation is between HDLC and triglycerides. And they have a number of gems in this study that I like for as smart as these guys are. Uh, they say, unexpectedly, after multivariate analysis, VLDL-associated uh, apolipoproteins and predominant lipids emerged as the strongest determinant of cardiovascular disease risk. I love that because <laughs> it once again brings us back to remnants, right? VLDLs are part of the remnants. Their residence time lingering in the bloodstream makes sense getting back to the energy model. What's not a remnant is LDL. And that's why, of course, when you see the apolipoproteins, 
that are associated with VLDLs. Those are the snaky bumps that sit on the top of them and a high supply in the bloodstream. There could be lots of bad reasons for that. But I still want to find those for which it would be associated with LDL. I'm not finding it yet. Needless to say, I've been going about this for years. And the reason this next section is just called finally, you'll find out in just a moment. But first, a confession. I have a pretty bad habit of making my hypotheses very public well before I have the data, and then announcing the data, however it turns out when I do, right? <laughs> I'm often reminded this is not how science is commonly done in the modern age. <laughs> For example, in a previous podcast from last year, during an intense exchange, I said the following. But just generally speaking, if I could get a big fat data set and stratify on those three axes, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. I think that would say a lot as to whether there's any validity to the energy model overall. And then at 5.05 p.m. on March 31st, I get the following text from Tommy Wood. Don't get too excited yet because Chris needs to do some sorting, but I think we have the data. He initial capped the data. Now, what's going to follow is going to be a little embarrassing for me, but I think it's worth capturing the moment so you can share it with me. <laughs> you know, I was just about to reach out to you regarding the energy model people. Go figure, but, and oh, man, can't wait. And you know me. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I want to know as soon as possible. But if I'm right, I want to know as soon as possible, of course. A little bit of time passes. I doubt there'll be a lot above 50 and below triglycerides, but the population is so big that maybe we'll have a decent sample size. More time passes. This, by the way, is on a Sunday. Tommy Wood has a family, by the way, I'm just mentioning. I think I'm going to need some drugs to get to sleep tonight. I'm just too damn excited about finally getting that query from your data. I've shaken so many trees for so long. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Now, technically, this is publicly available data. And for those of you who are like university students, you can get this data and follow along at home, right? For us civilians, it's a little bit trickier to get. And so I'm very thankful, very thankful for Tommy for putting up with me, because let me tell you, I was practically a science stalker for about the next five days. And once I got a hold of the data, many of you who follow me on social media probably noticed a near blackout, right? I practically disappeared because I was marinating in this data. OK, first though, I want to give a few caveats. This analysis is preliminary. I've worked and reworked this several, this several times. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some errors in it. Don't worry, this is not a conclusion. This is the beginning of a conversation. But this is different in that way. It's different because we have a shared data set that we're talking through. And I'll be very interested to hear what the explanations are going to be against this data set after I show you what I show you. This is also, and I should also mention, I'm not an epidemiologist or a statistician, so this will be quite basic, but that's how I wanted it all along. Virtually any study you read right now has a whole lot of modeling, has a whole lot of opaque adjustments, things that you can't, so many times I've said, God, I wish I could just get a hold of the data that they were using so that I could see what it is that they did to make it. It's an engineer thing. We're not actually known for, and when we're, when we're young, we're not really known for putting things together. We're known for taking things apart, just so you know. Those of you who know engineers know what I'm talking about. And of course, as always, all constrictive criticism is welcome. Emphasis on constructive, right? All right, here we go. This is what I did, and I did it this way and keeping it this simple because I want it to be very defensible. I want it to be something any reasonable person could appreciate that I did. And it's very simple. I took the original, step for, uh, original data for which everyone is eligible. I subtracted triglycerides, cholesterol, and HDL where they were blank. And then I removed where triglycerides were over 400, since we're going to be using the Friedwald equation. If you get above 400, it's problematic. So I then had the Friedwald equation version, which, of course, the equation is right here. 
which is the general standard, although there's other equations I like more. But that's the general standard. That's what we're going to go with. And without further ado, I immediately stratified the whole population of enhanes by LDL 20 at a time, right? which you can see before you now. I then flipped it, because I want to see all cause mortality. It makes it a little more interesting, and we can draw out where those key differences are. And then finally, I knocked out statins. I don't want any statin data in here, because mainly I just want to see those people who are not on statin, particularly if they have high LDL. Now, naturally, a statistician who's watching this right now is shaking their head. They're going, Dave, Dave, ah, you've already got a problem. In this chart over here on the left, you can see there's very small sample sizes as we get to the tails of either end of LDL. So we're going to make one key change. We're going to go ahead and grab each side of these and consolidate them in to their neighbor that has the largest sample size, right? That's the one adjustment we're gonna make and I'm showing you as it happens. We're gonna move that one over there, we're gonna move that one over there, and then we end up with six sextiles. And so here we see that as LDL cholesterol goes up, all-cause mortality likewise increases. All right, well, that's my talk. All right, thanks. Okay, okay, that's not actually my talk. So, truly, I, I, for what it's worth, true story, I told my wife, I said, uh, whatever that turns out to be, that's actually going to end up in my presentation. And I'm making good on that promise, right? This is what it was. The next thing I did, naturally, was to just confirm that basically all of these different sextiles are representative of the population. And... That would be pretty simple to do. I just need to look at what their ages were, and I just need to look at the follow-up times, make sure they all match. I was quite stunned to see that actually they don't. Once you stratify by the average age of each of these sextiles of LDL, which you can do by just taking the age at the time of the exam and adding it to the time to follow up, you get this column. And that looks like this. So let me restate this in a way that's a little easier to follow. If you take everybody in the NHANES data that has an LDL between 0 and 79 and average their age at last check, it's going to be around 45, age 45. If you take everybody whose LDL is 80 to 99 and calculate their age, it's going to be 48. And it keeps going up from there to where you have at the low end 45 and at the high end 60 years old. That's tough, because I don't know if you knew this, but age is a risk factor for death. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's another major confounder, which is if you stratify average follow-up time, you see something else. You see that each of these different portions of going from 0 to 79 all the way up to 160 to 1,000 also have some disparity in their follow-up time. And there's a lot of different possible explanations for this, which I'm not going to go into here. But this one's a little bit easier to work out, which I'll get into in the next slide. But the problem is, is that the longer follow-up time allows for more potential for mortality. So let's pretend that I split this room in half, right? And in this, in this part of the room, I'm going to check on you guys in 10 years. And in this part of the room, I'm going to check in you guys in 20 years. Which of these two are likely to have more deaths? <laughs> yes, everyone's pointing over this way. Right. The one that I check in on 20 years. So let's say that there's 10 deaths here, and there's 20 deaths here. That wouldn't surprise you guys, right? Would you, you guys would think that you're dying at about the same rate. Right. So that's easily solved. That's easily solved. And I'll show you how we do it. For solution one, there's not a lot I can do. I can only list when the average age shows the discrepancy, because any adjustment I make is going to be complicated, and I want to keep the audience with me. But for solution two, on the year's follow-up, all we have to do is take the mortality rate and divide it by the years since the follow-up. And from that, we get the mortality per year of follow-up. So in this case, it'd be 1% per year and 1% per year, right? Fairly straightforward. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look back at the populations. But we're going to have to split it now. Let's go ahead and split it right down the middle, go from age 50 and below. And unfortunately, what we find is that our average age 
basically wrecks us. While it does show that the mortality continues to increase as LDL goes up, unfortunately, the average age does as well. In fact, it's fairly disparate between 34 and 40. But when we look at age 50 and above, well then, now we finally have it. Now we have age parity with the average age. So this is it, because age 50 and above is probably what we care about the most anyway, right? That's where we're going to see the most mortality. Okay, so this is it. This is really it. No fake out. You ready? Here we go. Let's sit with this for just a second. Now, I want to bring in intellectual honesty one more time, real quick, because I do think it's possible, I do think it's possible that the critics are right, that some margin of those people on the left side who have very low LDL could be near, in, near end stages of death. But here's the catch. The NHANES data has long follow-up times, or at least long with regard to that argument, because they can be five to 10 years or even longer, right? Okay, that argument doesn't carry as much weight now in the NHANES data. So, no, I'm sorry. If you're looking at this from a percent of mortality per year of follow-up, this is very strongly associating that higher LDL, higher LDL is showing lower all-cause mortality. And guess what? This isn't my data. This is their data. In fact, this is data that's accessible to many people who are watching this right now. So again, this is the beginning of the conversation. I'm very interested to hear what it is that can make this data look anywhere, any way differently than how I'm showing it to you now. If you apply the triad, if you apply HDL above 50 and triglycerides below 100, unsurprisingly to me, you see that there's an improvement across every sextile, I'm just flipping back and forth between them, right? And where it gets even a little more interesting is if you Look at it against the population average. This is the NHANES average on the mortality per year in age 50 and up, I believe without statins. Not 100% sure if it's without statins, but I believe it's without statins. Now, just for fun, I went ahead and re-stratified it. Again, conceding that we lose a lot of statistical significance, but I wanted to see it absolutely spread out to all of the different levels of 20. And <laughs> what's fascinating about this is that's not an error over there where there's a couple zeros. There really are, as you can see over here, there are a total of six people, five of which are in the LDL between 240 and 259, and one who's in 260 to 279, and they're just being big jerks and not dying right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost as if they found a way to get so far, so far behind they're ahead, right? Uh, and once again, the population average is here. And they seem to be doing well. And after I stratified this and I saw that little spike there, the one that the 2.59 at the 180 to 199, I checked into it because I was curious. And sure enough, there was a little bit of a cluster of cancers in that grouping. Uh, almost, their neighbors, if you will, the, uh, the ones to the left and right for um, a few different strata, actually didn't have that much effect. Uh, because cancer, uh, cancer, believe it or not, has actually got a much lower association the higher you go with LDL. So I did find that fascinating, but again, this was another one of those cases where immediately I saw, oh, if I were being a little more dodgy, all I would need to do is just say, and hey, I wanted to be sure that we didn't get any cancer cases, so I'm adding neutrophils as part of the uh, criterion for the things that I want to put in, right? And I would have been able to knock out those cancer cases, but I'm not. Everything that you see is right up there, every adjustment that I'm making, so you can see it clearly. This, by the way, is uh, if you tweak it just a step further by taking triglycerides to 80 and below, you see actually a fairly strong uh, improvement in all-cause mortality. Once again, the population average. So I, wanna, I want to lastly just take a really close look. This is, again, from the NHANES data at the triad. And in particular, I wanted to look at those people who had LDL of 160 and above so that you could get to know them. You remember, as I said a little bit earlier in the text message to, um, to um, Tommy, that I was concerned that we wouldn't have enough people. I was wrong. We actually have plenty of people. There are 647 alive at last check from this survey 
that had this stratification, that had an LDL above 160, an HDL above 50, triglycerides below 100, that were not on a statin, clearly not listening to their doctors, right? So of those, 80 to 89, there were 48 in this population. 90 to 99, 13. Three 101-year-olds. Now, if you have a hold of the NHANES data, do me a favor, look right now at what centenarians are in the NHANES data that are alive. I already know. You want to know how many? Five. Five. That means three of them have this strata. 96 were deceased, and the average age of death by any cause was 78.8. Population average, 75.6. Now, if you're still interested in heart disease, you probably expect that at least there's a trade-off that they probably have and that they may have a lot more cardiovascular disease with the stratification of the triad, right? You want to know what the average age of the heart disease was? And this is for mortality, by the way, of those who died. 84.5. 84.5. And I'm actually just going to flat out list them. Because you can see, this isn't just an all over the place average. Actually, there's only two that are outside of the 80s. One who was 68 at the left side, and one who's 95 on the right side. Everyone else died in their 80s. So in summary, to put it in visual terms, this is not that. I know, I know, many people might complain and say, now wait a sec, we're talking about events, we're talking about cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. I hear you, and it may actually be true, I haven't gone through enough of the NHANES data, specifically in the area of cardiovascular disease, because all along I've cared the most about all-cause mortality. But I know many of you in this room absolutely identify with the fact that you're given the impression that this is all-cause mortality, that if you don't take steps to lower your LDL, you're going to die sooner, right? And that's why I care a lot more about the graph on the right side. I care about actual death that I can see and that I can track and that we can all agree on. Certainly there, are, certainly there is a lot of evidence that LDL, when looked at in isolation, can have an association with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. When looked at in isolation. However, when LDL is looked at in a deeper context of other risk markers, it can be benign or even beneficial, particularly with regard to all-cause mortality. Clearly, there is ample evidence that indeed context is extremely important when looking to LDL and its association with risk. While observational studies can be bad at confirming a hypothesis, this, by the way, I'm lifting from somebody else, I'm paraphrasing, uh, they can definitely help knock them down, right? That's what's actually good about cohort studies. For me personally, I believe there can be good and bad reasons for LDL to be high. And I want to be sure that I leave you with that. LDL being high or low is not something that I ever act on for myself or would act on for my family. And I would hope you wouldn't feel like you should as well. There are a lot of people, if I can go off script for a sec, there are a lot of people who when they see some of my research, they then take that as, hey, I don't need to pay attention to my lipid panel anymore. And I'm telling you, I pay more attention to lipid panels than I ever have in my life. It's just that I care a lot more about triglycerides and HDL, and you can see why. 85%, you better take care of that. (laughs) Good reasons, good reasons for LDL to be high may include being powered by fat. See the lipid energy model about that. Or recovering from an illness. By the way, before going into the next bullet point, I want to pitch Siobhan one more time. She's uh, not only going to have a great speech a little bit later today, but she's written quite a lot on illness, in particular the immune response. Oh, tomorrow, sorry. May have gotten moved. Uh, Bad reasons, bad reasons may include metabolic dysregulation or chronic illness that you aren't recovering on. Do you have a chronic illness that could result in a higher level of LDL? That's possible. So be mindful of that. Again, Though, the big tip-offs to each of these are often high triglycerides, low HDL, and or inflammatory markers. Lastly, are there many more incredible findings in the NHANES data? 
Yeah, there definitely are, which is why it's now going to be the last chapter in my new book, which is hopefully going to be coming soon. I want to uh, ask you to just give a quick round of applause to the people who make this possible. This is our members and patrons for this research. These are literally people who are actually paying every single month to make this happen. Would you mind giving them a round of applause? And I want to give a special thanks to Tommy Wood and Siobhan Huggins, especially, uh, for putting up with me, especially over the last month. I really appreciate all of their help, and thank you for listening to this. Ooh, with time to spare. And with time to spare, Chris, with time to spare. Just wanted to mention that. I think our MCs are around here somewhere. All right, that was awesome. Let's give Dave another round of applause. So, I don't know if Dave knows this, but he's going to be out in the hall answering questions right now. So feel free to go out, um, check out the booths, and we're going to resume here in about five minutes.